La Feria Internacional del Libro de Guadalajara presenta Hello, good afternoon, evening or days. We don't know at what time of the day you would be watching us or people would be watching in the future, but here we are in the International Encounter of Storytellers of the International Book Fair of Guadalajara, the virtual edition 2020. My name is Alberto Chimal and I'm very pleased to welcome you today in this virtual space which is and is not in the uh, area of the uh, field. And, but we're very pleased to have you here. This event has been held for more than 10 years, and it proposes to, it proposes to bring together a sample of the best of the storytelling that is being developed in Latin America, in Roman-speaking uh, countries, language-speaking countries. We have had more than 100 guests here, and we have had offerings of discussions and readings that have brought in a gathering of faithful audience that have grown to expect this event. And, uh, we're all very pleased about this. My name is Alberto Chimal, and in this case, I collaborate in the organization and uh, organizing this event for five years now. When the beginning beginner of this, Ignacio Padilla, the great storyteller of Mexico, in the first year he uh, passed, unfortunately speaking, and he was here in the beginning since, and since 1916, I have the great honor and the great pleasure of occupying his position now in this event. And now I have the honor of introducing this special edition of this event. It will have three sessions, the one we have today and the one for tomorrow fourth and the one on Saturday, which will be on the fifth and today on the third each one with great storytellers of our time. And to start off, I would like to introduce our guests for today who are already here with us, sharing their screen with us. First of all, Mariana Enriquez, who is a writer, a journalist, her uh, wrote in Radare, page 12, and she's a professor. She has written novels, stories, trip, uh, uh, stories, profiles, like the smaller sister, the younger sister, uh, about the writer Silvina Ocampo, and story collection, the dangers of smoking in bed and things lost in the fire. And this was published in 20 countries, awarded uh, Ciudad de Guasat. Barcelona Award in 2019, the Heralde of the novel with a part of the night. It brings together the horror and historical recreation winner of the Spanish Critic Award, director of the arts in her country. And along with her, we have Bernardo Esquinca, a Mexican writer. His works, his narrative has been included in the weird fiction genre. It mixes in police, fantastic imagination, and supernatural terror, among other books, the Saga Casasola, composed by the Eighth Plague, All of the Blood, and uh, in, Infra World, and the books of the Trilogy of Terror, The Hey Children, Demonia, and Black Sea, along with Vicente Girarte, who uh, wrote the fantastic uh, story of the city of Mexico. He wrote the incredible stories of the uh, amazing Edgar Allan Poe, his most recent book that just appeared this year, The Book of the Gods. 
habitualmente en el encuentro normally speaking in this event in the international storytelling event we ask the guest to read a full story because this session is uh, in digital format there this will be briefer than the uh, normal sessions we will only hear one of the fragments of uh, that text so that then they can talk to us about it and also reply to the questions from our audience as we get them so so let's start with this and heal the floor let's start the team right with mariana enriquez good evening first of all uh, afternoon uh, wherever you're watching uh, with alberto bernardo i love uh, seeing you so it's this way we are now used to meeting in this way and i think it's a habit now it's the anthology and it's in this book in the dangers of smoking in bed the cistern and the water system so it starts like this if you now remember the heat and in the renault uh, asked if the trip had just happened a couple of days back not when she was six years ago a few days after christmas under the suffocating sun of january and her mother was driving practically without speaking so her mother was in the front seat and josefina was in the back seat trapped between her grandmother and the sister rita who was flooding the smell of the fruit of the tangerines and they were driving to visit the maternal uncles for vacation that was just one part of the reason for the trip that Josefina could not guess what it was she remembers that nobody spoke a lot the grandmother and the mother were wearing dark glasses and they only spoke to one about a truck that was passing by very close to the car or class the father to drive slower and they were tense and alert waiting for an accident to happen they were afraid they were always afraid in the summer when josefina and mariela wanted to take uh, to bathe Melo Picho, they only filled it with 10 centimeters of water and would observe on watching said, under a lemon tree to make it in time in case the granddaughters would drown. Josefina remembered that the mother was crying and calling the ambulances if her she or her sister had fever or made them being school. school if they had a call they never gave them permission to sleep over with friends and barely let them work down uh, play in the path if they did she was watching behind the windows sometimes mariela would cry in the night saying that something was moving under her bed and she could never sleep with it so Josefina was the only one that was never afraid like her father until that trip so that's all i'm going to read that's the beginning uh, so that uh, we can hold this conversation thank you mariana i want to remind the people that are watching us i want to remind the people that are watching us that there is a special streaming on facebook and youtube it's in spanish and there's another streaming in english on youtube just in case you want to recommend it to any other person so that they can follow this conversation and we will now continue continue with Bernardo Esquinca. Hello, Mariana. Hello, Alberto. It's a pleasure to be here at the International Event for Storytellers. Before I read a fragment of my story, I want to remember Nacho Padilla as the initiative of this event. Sadly, he went ahead of us. I want to remember him fondly. He is a storyteller that one has to read. It's very interesting to read his micropedia that can now be obtained in just one volume. The best tribute to any author is to read him and remember him fondly. And the story that I'm going to read is, the, uh, is called The Last Dinner at the Tundra 
and it's uh, a book that has not been published yet. And the most obvious thing was the fish. It did not represent uh, a problem to go to Japan and eat fugu in a specialized story uh, restaurant. The flavor was the least. The adrenaline of placing our life at risk, uh, along with the singularity of an experience of eating puffer fish, fish generated an excitement that uh, went into the sexual aspects. Valerie passed her tongue through over the lips, licking at in excess of mustache, and James was looking towards the other tables with a static glare, glance, as if he was expecting the moment in which another person would die. Would die. And I placed my napkin to cover my erection. And then we finished this dinner in, at a karaoke bar, singing songs that we did not understand. We were uh, drunk. Uh, little elegant uh, ending for having eaten puffer fish. Of course, we wanted more. Soon new members joined our private club and we called it the SSS secret civil rights society of care aware to this wing of the nazi to deprivation uh, and with time we were nine members in order to form uh, be part of it there were three requirements to be rich ready to squander it with gastronomic make cuisines eccentric and dangerous and knowing no limits of decency we carried out different activities but the main thing was the end of the year dinner the organization rotated among the members the challenge was that each event would be better than the previous one in time the tone went up reaching notes that were delirious reaching the climax of this evening the summit moment in the story of the sss something that was really worthy of the reasons of its foundation but i am getting ahead and we will stop here thank you very much bernardo bueno pues para para comenzar to start this conversation, uh, before that, I have to uh, share some information. For the people that don't know this, this uh, event publishes an anthology with all of the stories, with a sample of the work of each one of the guests uh, to this event. That anthology under normal circumstances is published and distributed in the field. On this occasion, because we are in a virtual environment, you can download it for free. You can find the links very easily in the, on the website in the field. I don't know if that's included in the descriptions of the video. I'm sure it will be accessible so that you can read the full stories, the complete stories that we have heard of now with, directly from the mouth of the authors. And I was getting ahead. Now, knowing the work uh, that each one of them has, Mariana and Bernardo, and knowing these stories, I can anticipate a good part of what is going to happen. And I know that it will have to do in many ways with the breakthrough of something terrible, mysterious, and maybe at a given moment, supernatural natural, as it happens in much of your work, in this environment that in spite of having certain uh, characteristics are daily to you or apparently uh, something common to you, that is a feature that you share in common. And now remembering with the biography that Bernardo has, sometimes he is called weird fiction, a narrative of the uh, weird. Tell me about these stories and about your interests to, uh, to create stories. Speak to me about that. Can I start? Mariana. Go right ahead. The story of this is very specific. It's the first story I wrote and the first one I published. And I wrote it. It was a changing point up to that point. I had never written short narrative. I have written two novels and the two novels were uh, were 
had the participation of male voice and off, and they were realistic. The first one, not so much. It has its part of uh, uh, things that were not common. It was Claybach, but uh, the second one, definitely speaking, was a realistic, maybe sordid, dark, but realistic. And I always wanted to write this genre. I wanted to uh, to combine fan fantastic and terror. And I had an enormous difficulty. They, they were in a novel, a fantastic novel, that I had ruled out completely. I threw it out. I mean, it, uh, it was a failure. I had never written a story, much less for an anthology. I made a decision. Um, I made a decision. I was barely known. I wasn't so well known. And I, de I decided to face two problems. I was a female writer. That, uh, was it was difficult. When I uh, wrote the characters, they seemed like me. The narrators spoke like me. They weren't really characters. They didn't have a separate life. And then it was also difficult, or I didn't know how to work the terror in my recreation what I had already read of course I have that I needed to find my own fears the phobias in my society and so that this what became a story about women, about overprotection of ch children, about craziness or madness, the topics that I was interested in, and the fantastic and supernatural intersection that happens is the encounter of this girl with a pagan saint of the northern part of Argentina. It doesn't have to do anything with Santa Muere, the Holy Dead. No, it's another type of universe. But it's a pagan universe. This is a saint that started like a cult to the ancestors and it wound up being something else. And now it has its own good part and it has a very dark part. Visually speaking, it's impressive. Uh, when I was little, I used to see this in my relative's house. It's a skeleton in one of the representations. There's another one that is called the Lord of the Patience. He's a small one sitting here waiting and that's the intersection with the supernatural i took it from the pagan saint calendar from the experience of my family and the fears and it came out good uh, i still read it and i find some problems in it but it i could have improved it for a first short story it was like um, opening a door and from there i was able to so write short stories, I became passionate. I understood how to do it. And as a paradox, I understood this by facing the difficulties. For me, it was very difficult to write short stories. I had never done that. And uh, Bernardo, what can you tell me? This is a story that has not been written. It's the other extreme. Uh, this is your newest production. This is a story that I wrote three years ago. Uh, around this time, I was asked to write a short story for a supplement in Mexico City that was going to de be dedicated. The edition was going to be dedicated for New Year's, and I could do anything I wanted, and it had to be dedicated for the New Year Eve. And I had read a story, I remember that I collect these type of uh, stories from the newspapers, uh, morbid stories, and that's what I'm interested in. They generate ideas. Maybe at that time when I read the story, I can't think of a short story, but it's like a collection of stories, and it helps me when I get requests that uh, you have maybe two weeks to write a short story. So this article that I had read had to do with a group of people that have come together or gathered to hold a very special dinner with the meat of an extinct 
animal. I don't want to provide a lot of detail. If you don't know the story, that would be a spoiler. But it has to do with that. That was an article, a real life article, in which they were eating an animal that was extinct. It was kind of a legend in a circle, scientific circle. And that article drew my attention greatly. And it led me to think about this idea that there was a club of sybarites that was extreme uh, of millionaires that could uh, do this and their progression towards these desires was increased the story starts with the puffer fish challenge but other type of challenges occur which become more extreme until they reach the summit but it all started precisely from all of this from real life art I exaggerate it and then I make it deadly associated to New Year's and it's gruesome and it's macabre that this what this civil rights group is doing and and I can confirm this that I didn't, didn't do it with an intention everybody that eats meat in this story has a very bad ending terrible ending I had turned to being a vegetarian the mind plays uh, uh, tricks on you I didn't do it like now I'm going to be a vegetarian so I'm going to be on the people that meat simply when the story had already been published and I reread it and I said your subconscious is playing on you there are many points in that time there are many stories that I have not published in which meat eaters have a bad ending I might be playing tricks and there are stories that I wrote along with these others that have to do with the idea of eating. I wrote them in parallel to the new book, the Book of the Gods. I consider that they did not fit. The Book of the Gods casts a special theme, which is the presence of the ancient gods in our current world. And so these stories, and specifically the last uh, dinner in the tongue, had, was not related. I understood it was part of a new collection that I'm writing now and that will be completed and published. Muy bien. Muchas gracias. All right. Thank you very much. You see that there is a type of parallel which is very interesting because at the same time, in these stories, we the, you have the beliefs these ideas that are uh, beyond us, outside of us, my mythology, notions about traditions or habits or social life, but this type of trend, hidden trend, something that is explicit of the inner workings of the inner mind, like the castle, like what Bernardo was uh, like how Bernardo was punishing us. What is the association of one thing with the other, that death in the inner part? And we see this in you, the work that you two have. How does this connect to the exterior? Outside of just these stories, these short stories, how does this reflect in the rest of your work? For me, it's complex because I tend to think that what I write is not, let's see, has much to do with my obsessions and it has much to do with my interests, but I try to disappear personally from what I write or to hide myself. It happens many times that I have to point, write down those things that are real or the things that are really direct, directly related to me and they are not sometimes the most obvious thing. I may get the distinction because there are those things that I would be ashamed of writing. It's like if I was writing here and someone was reading over my shoulder, I would be embarrassed. Those are the moments where I know that I'm telling the truth in a story, but at the same time, I hide 
a bit. I think that I don't like, even when I write self fiction, self fiction, I don't like to open myself too much. For me, literature has always in a way, well, it might sound strange, but it's a way, a very sophisticated way of hiding. Bernardo? Bernardo, I don't hide because I can't avoid it. Uh, I'm in there, but it's not an egocentric thing, egotistic. It's unavoidable to be too transparent. That's the way I lead my personal life. So my friends that read me, that know me well, they tell me, particularly in the characters, that character is you, Casasola, the journalist in the Casa Sola saga, several friends have told me that's you and you are very similar. It's not something that was intended and that's how it happens. And I suppose that many of the characters in my story as well occur like this, but it's something that I cannot control. So that part and responding to your question, Alberto, uh, how you, do, you, do you handle this, your inner world, my obsessions, my narrative, my, uh, my story? Telling, how do I balance it with the exterior? I have to do it because I don't have an interesting life at all. If I only spoke about myself, my short stories would be very boring. And the last thing I want is to bore my readers. I am a nosy body. I'm curious of other people's life. And there are people that know me well, people that are close to me that sometimes say, stop asking so many questions. They might feel invaded because I am very attentive to what other people think, to the experience that other people live, how they speak, so that then uh, those people that do have much more interesting lives, I incorporate many of those things in my storytelling and particularly I am in the supernatural genre I don't have that gift or that doom of seeing processes or ghosts because I'm always so afraid uh, if I had that gift I would have a heart attack but I am surrounded by people I have been surrounded by people that do have that singularity of seeing the other worlds that are in our worlds. So I ask questions, endless questions. What did you see? What did you feel? And I incorporate all of those elements in my storytelling. And that's who I bring together my personal world, which I represent in my storytelling with the outer world, which is necessary. Otherwise, my stories would not be what they are. Bernardo, thank you very much. We're getting questions from our audience, so I'm going to read some. For example, I like you the stories that the guests have, and I like that both of them write about the beyond. Do you have any relationship by the Toms of Atuan represented by Ursula Kalewin? That's interesting. Not directly. Uh, there is a part in my novel, a part of the night, night, I called it the left hand to as a tribute to Ursula. I read a lot about her and it has nothing to do with the dark side of the, uh, the, uh, the dark hand of the night. There are some adjutant characters. Uh, it's just a tribute. I think that there are many writers of all of us that are working in this generation that are working with what we're talking about. It's just scratches in And what we imagine on the other side can be the other side, the beyond the darkness, and so many things. But it's a reality that exists alongside ours, and we do not see. In my case, it's 
it's not a reference to Ursula. In fact, it's one of the books that I still have to read. I'm very interested in reading her, and I have been looking for the left hand of darkness for some time here in Mexico. It's impossible to get it. Uh, now, there's more reason to read this. Uh, after this question, I want to read it, and I want to find the, the tombs of Atuan. As Mariana said, it's a coincidence, and that is a term that other writers use as well, the, beyond the other side, referring to the other worlds that are inner worlds. All right, thank you. A question for Marianne, from Marianne, uh, for Marianne Enriquez. Your short stories make me feel anguish. Why is it so important to cause this effect? What is this role of anguish in your vision of literature? I don't know if it was my intention to cause that effect. I think it happens. I think that it has to do, I, in most of my short stories, I work with horror, obviously, and it's a horror that stems, as we were saying before, from the common things, the daily things. The stories, the short stories start off in a very realistic style or tone, something that is totally recognizable. So when the break point occurs in the reality, something that you cannot go back from in most of the cases, which is horrendous, there's nothing beyond. Behind that, I understand that it can generate anguish. The role that it plays is, is that horror it generates anguish, and many times reality also. So when you match this and merge this, there is suffering for my readers, and I hope it ends when the short story ends. And that's it. Thank you. Another question for the two of you. With your short stories, you will pretend to reflect historical problems and social circumstances. And what are the relationships with prehistoric times? Bernardo, he's more pre-Hispanic, pre-Hispanic. I'm in a intention of depicting social and historical problems, no, but there are things that uh, seep in because we are people that live in a reality of which we are concerned for and you're always observant of it. I've written historical novels, the Carne de Ataúd and the one about Elgar Allan Poe, they're historical. But in my short stories, there are historical elements. But I don't consider myself a historian, much the less. I think that the layers of history and this country has many, and the city of Mexico has so many, allows me to access to plots and ideas that I believe are interesting, that I bring forth to the present. I like to play with the different layers of history, starting from the present and how the characters uh, find the reality that has not disappeared, that is, in, uh, comes from their ancestors. When one walks down the core area of Mexico cities, you have archaeological Windis colonial buildings, the modern buildings, you have this, this incest on the layers of history that seeps in to my fiction. Even though my characters live in the present, it seems that they are always digging, and they find these layers of history and they have meaning. They nurture into my short stories that provides the meat of flesh. It's not only an entertaining short story, but there are many other meanings, many layers of meanings. The relationship of fantastic stories with pre Hispanic topics. There are so many examples in Latin America Chatmore, Carlos Fuentes, Fiesta Brava, Jose Emilio Pacheco, The Noche Boca Arriba, or Boca Abajo, Cortázar. 
it has to do with the war, and there's a tradition of rescuing the stories. Yes, Alberto was saying it was the face up. I always get it confused. But there's a whole tradition, if it's face up or face down, of incorporating the pre Hispanic uh, elements to our narrative. If this is a past that we have not reconciled, and many times it comes back ominously on everything because something that occupies a space does not yield. If it comes back to take over the space, and this happens to the ancient gods. Thank you. Let's see another question. What is the process you follow to create your short stories? Does it have a model? Mariana? Briefly, uh, I, I use a structure uh, for me. The stories are yeah, the characters and the development of the characters. I reserve that. When a character comes, what prevails is the character. That's a novel or a short novel. But it has the workings of a novel. When you have an idea, that's a story to such a point that some readers say, how did you think about the uh, character of Aura, I, of Laura in the story? I just called it X, and then I named it Laura because I had to give the character a name. Laura is a person allowing for something to happen I want to occur in that short story that is related to the situation I want to speak about. So that's on the one hand, I am obsessed by an idea and I uh, build the idea with different elements. And in other cases, what happens is that there is some um, something that is related to reality that triggers a situation or a argument for a short story. It could be like this in one of my stories. The things we lost in the fire, a girl with her skin was burnt and she would pedal and ask for money. She would beg. She generated a dystopic image. This woman burnt herself voluntarily. If this is related to gender in a fact, uh, it's associated to Ballard. And it could be a crime. I'm a journalist. I'm not uh, right. I, I do not write about real events, but uh, what I have because of working in this field, I have an antenna. I know when a fact, a police uh, event is iconic. Otherwise, it's one of the things that off every day. But there's something that to prevail, best represent police violence because it's horrendous and, or there's despair or something underlying it. So those are my two sources. An idea, something I want to say, speak about that drives me crazy or I'm passionate about, something uh, in reality, something I saw out in the street, something I was told or a suggestion something of uh, news, a real like some uh, article I read in the news and I use it. Very similar to Mariana. Maybe something that I do observe that I need to write a story. That's just one idea is not enough. And I, I think about uh, an idea to write a short story and I wait until it crosses with a second idea. When that happens, I'm ready to write a short story in Black See, the first sto short story is The Ancient Fathers. I had gone to Bacalar, it's a lagoon in the southeastern part of Mexico to do a workshop. And the person that invited me said, told me that there was stromatolites in that lagoon that were related to the origin of life. 
And this is enough for a story. I need more. After the workshop, Bacala is exuberant. It has so many critters and bugs. I had felt paranoia. I hit the bugs. When I went back to Mexico City and I made a re did some research, I saw that NASA had studied them because they believe that the live in March, well, this was years back, that life on March was also related or associated to forms of a life that were similar to stomatolites. When NASA appeared on the sea, two stories connected. So I have a paranoid conspiracy. That's the example where I need two ideas to come together to complete a story, a short story. Another question. In the, from, in the beginning, how did you, you get published when the publishers do not uh, accept these genres so easily, the fantastic and the terror? In that case, the trust of the publisher is fundamental. Jorge Ralden is not in an agram, but at that point, I had an agent. She read my short stories, and the intersection was interesting. The mix of realism with horror in such a clear way. And she said, maybe. And he took it to Arralde and he liked it. He bet on it. And I think that there's nothing much more aside from that. Someone that trusts you and does not have bias can trust your vision. Anagram is a very general uh, publisher. It's not specific in general. When it's, they allow the authors to be published or they don't stop publishing uh, the uh, foreign writers, they publish. And in that regard, my publisher in Anagram, she trusts uh, uh, my work. She likes what I do, and she knows deeply that terror as a minor genre is a historical misunderstanding, and that that is also part of the role of the literary publishers to break away from that, to take the writers uh, to the literary publishers, because it's unfair. Everything that is happening is unfair, but it's the trust that this publisher might have in you. I have the fortune of having a publisher, Guillermo Quijas, who is in Almadía, who has trusted me. And when I brought uh, my first book more than 10 years ago to Almadía, it's been more than 10 years and 10 books I have published with Almadía between short stories and novel and anthologies. And in that context, which were the, 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 the first book of the trilogy, and there was great openness to say we're interested in this book, we want to publish it will want to promote it. And in that time, I was speaking, 2008. Now, fortunately speaking, there is there are more people, particularly young people that are betting on the genre. And now it's much more common for the publishing houses to support terror or supernatural or fantastic genre. That has a good reception in Latin America. This content is familiar with that, eh, with the religious thinking, with the magical thinking and superstition. This is natural to us. But in 2008 in Mexico, there weren't many people writing about terror. And, the, uh, and Almadia liked this. And I remember, according to the interviews, journalists were a bit surprised uh, that it was thought that I was writing terror stories short stories. They like the book. And then after that, uh, there's channels have opened up, of course. It's much more common and it's good. It's good because this genre has much to offer uh, to connect the the world we live in from a different perspective. Another question, following the same line, for the two of you, what would be your best advice to start writing horror or suspense? With, uh, without any being afraid of rejection or being concerned about this uh, concept. 
Eh, bueno, pues no hay que preocuparse ah, yes. tal cual, es decir, eh, you, you shouldn't be concerned or worried. Sí preocupa, ¿no? que, que you should be no, so no conscientious. There are people no that say I don't want blood in the no short stories no or violence or I don't es, want eh, si sex. I would say if the story requires it, there will be blood and if it doesn't require it, you don't add it if it requires violence add it and the same thing with sex the complicated topics honesty is very important one has to live according to with what you need to speak about and with your own obsessions the story asks for what you need you don't add more you don't take away from what the story demands you have to follow your intuition uh, you shouldn't be concerned if someone is going to reject it or not, or if someone is going to like it or not. And you first must like it, you must polish it and present it to your acquaintances, the people that read it to you. You must not be scrupulous. No type of literature should happen. Art is not a morale. Uh, Oscar Wilde said this more than a hundred years ago. You follow one's intuition, you follow the story, and then uh, scruples will be left aside. Eh, otra pregunta más. El realismo Another question. Bernardo, uh, realism with horror. Género, Bernardo, what you ejemplo, say is that uh, is a new genre or is a hybrid? Is it a hybrid? El realismo con horror. Realism with horror. Híbrido o nuevo, dice, ¿verdad? A hybrid o nuevo genre. Uh, es buena pregunta. Eh, yo creo que That's a good question. I think that it has always existed. We always start from a, an actual event. Mariana said this as well. We start from uh, articles in from the newspapers. Uh, I also use this. There's a part of reality in which horror appears. appears. Maybe it's much more common to, that it happens recently. But if you date back to Frankenstein, Marichelle, uh, it's a fantastic novel, but Marie Shelley was much up to date. Well, we're speaking about uh, the, a book that was published in 18... 1918, she followed science in the beginning of the 19th century, electricity, certain experiments at a time in which science was being developed. There is scientific research there uh, behind Frankenstein's story that Mary Shelley combines with fiction to create uh, the modern Prometheus and the resurrection of a body that was assembled from the pieces of other corpses. And going back to that very important example in universal literature, she was starting from scientific facts of her time, which she then transformed into fantasy. So that is a mix of, real, mix of realism with fantasy. And that thing that, I think that that has accompanied this genre from the beginning. And even if one writes about vampires, they start from a reality, they stem from a reality, which was the past, the play. In the medieval ages, we got Mariana back. Sí. Yes, I know. Eh, quería meter un pequeño, un pequeño bocado con esto de, de realismo y... y... I wanted to uh, add about a real seven horror. That's what Stephen King does. Really, if you think about a famous novel like Pet Cemetery, a family that moves into a house right next to the road, the cat dies, and they uh, uh, they they uh, bury it, and it turns out that the cemetery may, brings back people to life, and they find that on page fifty. But it's a normal family in the beginning. It's like he's a physician, he's a doctor, and has an encounter with a patient. That's unconcerning, but you're not quite clear if that was a ghost or not. But what I mean to say, I think that from the 70s or 80s is what Bernardo and I are doing in a different way, We're stemming from recognizable situations and from there definitely go to the supernatural. 
That is something that was started uh, before Bradbury and Shirley Jackson in some of their stories. And King does this in a very popular way. What happens is that we're not so clear about that because they're so famous that we don't see it. It's like having to remember that Tom Hanks is a very good actor or Steven Spielberg are very good directors. They, Those things are so obvious. But uh, that's what it's about. The Shining, uh, that was a writer that couldn't write and has domestic violence issues. He broke his son's arm and who wants to go to a secluded place to write. And it turns out that that place has ghosts and it's haunted. Up to that point, everything is recognizable and everything is totally realistic. And I would say that he is a great North American realistic. They, he writes about social problems in North America. Of course, we have time for one last question of the several that we have received. I want to thank all of the people that are participating with us. Uh, one more question, and this is for the two of you. When you write a short story in your creative moment, do you always know what the end is going to be? Or at some point, does, are you possessed by what you are writing? And that leads, does the short story take a life of its own? In my case, many times, I don't know the end. I do need to know how I start. I don't take notes. I'm very superstitious. If I take notes for some cosmic reason, then uh, Lovecraftian, uh, the story won't happen. And I go over the plot uh, in my head, what I know about it. I imagine how to start. And generally speaking, at midway through the short story, I know what is important. I've never piloted a plane, but I guess at some point you have to plan where you're going to land. It's important to know maybe halfway where you're going. And then I start seeing how I take it to that ending. There are times where I am very clear on the ending, and then I only have to go down the path. Let's say I generally don't know. That's the best thing. I myself will be surprised of the ending, and that will also happen to the reader. I tend to have a clear idea of the ending. What happens is that in general, there are not endings that are very uh, final. I'm clear in a broad sense, let's say. I know more or less how, where it's going to end. I know that the characters or the idea or whatever is moving towards that. But in general, either must complete them, they are uncertain. I don't like to just leave it at open and they are uncertain. There are moments I don't have to anyone to add. That can change a bit. But in general, what I have to see is where I'm going to. That happens. Changing the ending abruptly, that has happened on rare occasions. Maybe I would modify. I think that something is not good is to be obsessed, is being in control of the text. The text, you have something in your head and then something different happens when you're writing. When one is writing, the text has a life of its own. It's an animal that is a slippery, slimy animal. You can't have all of the control. It happens. Sometimes I'm battling with the text. I want it to do things that it's not doing. And I believe that in that battle then is this part when the text just occurs and it's alive. Thank you very much, Mariana. Thank you, Bernardo. We're running out of time, and I want to thank the two of you. I want to thank all of the people that are watching us, who will also be watching us in the mysterious future, wherever this conversation is kept in the different times. And of course, I want to thank the International Book Fair of Guadalajara for giving us an opportunity for this event for short stories. 
and the anthology will be available for download so you can read the rest of the stories from Mariana Enriquez and Bernardo Esquinca and the other guests that we will have tomorrow at 1300 hours central time in Mexico City. We will have Lydia Jorge, the recipient of the feat in Romance Languages this year, along with Eduardo Halfa, and on Saturday, at 1300 hours, we will also have Marcelo Luján, the recipient of Rivera del Tuera, by Pasión de Espuma, and Maria Fernanda Puero. We will continue speaking about short stories and their works. And we will be streaming on YouTube in Spanish and English as well as in Facebook, where we will be able to receive your comments. Thank you very much once again, and see you next time. Thank you, Bernardo. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. La 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 la